Greetings to all participants and to all honorable guests. We are very pleased to welcome all of you here today to the public lecture on the US Supreme Court decision-making process, which is co-organized by the Faculty of Law, Sulalongkorn University, and the Judicial Training Institute. In line with this, we would like to thank the Judicial Training Institute for the support and for bringing light to the topic. Before we start the session, may we welcome Assistant Professor Parina Siwanit, Dean of the Faculty of Law, Jalalongkorn University, to give an opening remark. Good evening, good morning, <laughs> Professor Matthew Stevenson, distinguished um, speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Faculty of Law, Jalalongkorn University, I am delighted to welcome all of you, whether in this room or online, to our Law Jula Public Series. It gives us a great honor to be hosting today's, today's event in cooperation with the Judicial Training Institute. This year, we at Law Jula are very privileged to have a visiting scholar from Harvard Law School, Professor Matthew Stevenson. May I take this opportunity to formally welcome you Professor to Jalalongkorn University. Professor Matthew Stevenson graduated Bachelor of Arts, Doctor of Philosophy in Political Science, and Juris Doctor, a law degree in the US, all from Harvard University. He is a renowned expert in anti-corruption. He will be with us at Jalalongkorn for six months, conducting research on law and economics and anti-corruption, with faculty members of the Faculty of Law and Faculty of Economics. He also offers a series of movies evenings and of training workshop for our students. At Harvard Law School, he teaches administrative law, legislation and regulation, and political economy of public law. Prior to joining Harvard Law School, he clerked for senior judge Stephen Williams on the Court of Appeal for the DC Circuit, and then for Justice Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court of the United States. As we are aware, through its decisions, ranging from the issues of gun control, same-sex marriage, abortion, carbon emission reduction, and many others, the US Supreme Court play a significant role in policy making and affect not only legal, but political, economic, and social effects on the society and rights of the people. And today, Professor Stevenson will share with us his thoughts on the US Supreme Court decision-making process, particularly on recent controversial um, Supreme Court decisions. I am certain that this session will be a precious learning opportunity for Law Jula students and every one of us here. Lastly, let me also thank Dr. Am Tang Niran, the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Law, for organizing this event, and thanks to our students who will be serving as moderators of the lecture. I must also thank the Judicial Training Institute for co-hosting the event and providing simultaneous translation to Thai. And most importantly, I am grateful to have you with us, Professor Matthew, and thank you very much Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Professor Matthew Stephenson. All right, thank you, Assistant Professor Parina, for warm welcoming remarks. So the format of today's lecture, we'll be having an engaging conversation with Professor Stevenson on the US Supreme Court decision-making process. So the discussion will last about an hour and a half, and then we will have a Q&A session at, in the end. During the conversation, participants in the room can scan the QR code provided in the line group to post questions for our Q&A session and at the end. Participants in the room can also raise your hand and the mic there will be microphone around for you to speak up about the questions. 
Participants at home can post questions on the comment section on the Facebook live coverage. So with that, let's start with our discussion. So as you know, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, have an influential role in the U.S. legal system. They rule on many significant issues, social e economic issues, uh, many issues that have implications beyond legal uh, implications. So can you describe the importance of the Supreme Court as a, as a core institution in the U.S. legal system for us? Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, before I, before I ad address your question, I just want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for coming and to thank the dean, the vice deans, and the Chula Lungkorn Law Faculty for welcoming me this semester. I've felt nothing but uh, warmth and hospitality, and it's such a wonderful community. I'm just, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm especially glad this morning to have the opportunity to engage with students. Uh, about these issues. It's, it's uh, striking to me that there's so much interest on the part of Thai uh, law students and other students on the U.S. Supreme Court and U.S. institutions, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to today's dialogue. So um, your first question was, was, to, to add, was, was a question about the role that the U.S. Supreme Court plays in the U.S. political system, and as you said, the role is quite significant. It has been for some time. It wasn't necessarily foreseen at the founding of the United States that the Supreme Court would be such a significant institution. Uh, there was a famous incident where a justice of the Supreme Court resigned in order to run for governor of New York because that was considered to be a more important position at the time. Uh, but over time, the Supreme Court has assumed a very prominent role in U.S. politics, issuing rulings on some of the most controversial issues of the day. It is worth keeping in mind that the Supreme Court does also function as the court of last resort in what we might think of as ordinary cases. When you read the headlines, uh, you might think that all of the Supreme Court's cases deal with the most uh, politically contentious, controversial front page of the newspaper issues like abortion and gun control and capital punishment and climate change and so forth. A lot of the Supreme Court's cases never make headlines because they deal with issues that might actually be quite important, but that are more technical issues of law, if you will, that are not the kinds of things that are obviously politically contentious. So for example, when I clerked at the court, we had a very important case about civil procedure and, and class actions. We had a, a significant case about the tax code. Uh, we had other cases like that which again might be important to the legal system, but if you're not a lawyer, you might not realize why it's so important. Yet, exactly as you say, the Supreme Court also has weighed in on many, many very contentious and controversial issues, and that in and of itself is controversial. There's an ongoing debate in the United States and in many other countries as well about whether courts should resolve disputes that seem to implicate these fundamental political issues or whether the courts should stay out. Sometimes that manifests itself in whether the court should adopt doctrines formally or informally that treat certain kinds of issues as political questions on which the court should not opine. Sometimes it manifests in the legal doctrine as the question of the appropriate degree of deference that the court should grant to other actors. So this comes up with respect to um, when the president does something that's legally controversial that might be pushing the limits of the president's authority, uh, when an executive agency does something that might be pushing the limits of its authority, when the Congress enacts a statute that arguably is pushing the limits of its authority. Uh, there are some who take the position that if it's a close case or even an arguable case on behalf of the government entities involved, the court should stay its hand and, and defer and only rule another branches of government's conduct unlawful if it's really clear and obvious. But on the other hand, there is an understanding that one of the roles the court is supposed to play is to make sure that the other branches of government comply with the law. Right? People who defend the prominent role the Supreme Court has played in the U.S. system will emphasize that in a system based on the rule of law, where even the elected branches of government can't do whatever they want but have to stay within the boundaries set by the Constitution but also by statutory and other law, that the courts are there precisely to figure out whether, pay, whether uh, 
the, those branches of state inbounds or have gone out of bounds. But it's a constant tension because, of course, notwithstanding the, the language that that's people sometimes use, the courts are like the referees, right, at a, at a sporting event. They're not, um, you can't completely separate law and politics or ideology or philosophy, especially in hard cases where the law is not clear. And that's one other thing I want to emphasize. I think is really important to keep in mind. The cases that come before the US Supreme Court tend to be the hardest cases, or at least the most controversial cases. Because if the law on some point is clear, and all the lower courts agree on it, and the case is pretty easy, the Supreme Court probably won't take it in the first place. That's not always true. Sometimes an issue arises in a particular context where the Supreme Court takes a case and nine to nothing issues an opinion. But, but the cases that we tend to focus on typically are hard cases for one reason or another. And when the law is least clear or where there are strong arguments on both sides of, of, of a question, that's when I think one's political views, ideology, philosophy can make the most difference. I'm not sure if that, I hope that was answering your question, but feel free to, to, to follow up. I want to hear from, from both of you and others as well. So I think that would be, would be a great point to ask you about the ideologies or the views of the justices in this court. So as you have mentioned, there, there are varieties of views about the in, interpretation of laws among the justices. So could you explain that a little bit about the conflicting ideologies, maybe about judicial restraint, judicial activism, and maybe something about originalism, as some of you may have heard, or purposivism, textualism, and, the, also, and also the traditional views about the political spectrum among the liberals and the conservatives among the justices? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. And for those of you who follow the US Supreme Court and read about it, it's one that you might be uh, especially interested in because much of the characterization of the division of the Supreme Court does frame it in traditional political terms, the left wing of the court, which has gotten smaller, and the right wing of the court, which has gotten bigger. And I do think that's, that's not unfair, I think, as a first cut characterization. I think the only people who will say with a straight face that traditional liberal conservative left right politics has nothing to do with how the justices make decisions are the justices themselves who, who like to say that no, 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 that has nothing to do with anything, but we all know that it does. Um, and so there's, a, and, and what liberal conservative mean in the context of US politics? Again, I shouldn't just assume that everyone's familiar with the, the political divisions in the United States. Well, those are simplifications too. Not all people who are liberal have the same views and not all people who are conservative have the same views. But, but typically, as, as um, those terms matter here, typically people on the left of the political spectrum tend to be uh, more concerned about economic and social equality, more willing to have uh, a more active government role in regulating the economy, regulating society, redistribution. Um, typically, we'll have what we think of as more progressive social or cultural values, greater concern about discrimination against traditionally disadvantaged um, minorities, uh, uh, in not only racial minorities, but also gender or sexual minorities, and be less uh, committed to preservation of what you might think of as traditional values. Those on the right end of the political spectrum tend to have a greater faith in not necessarily unregulated but less regulated markets, uh, are more sympathetic to the idea that um, private ordering is often superior to uh, government intervention. Uh, typically, though not universally, are more sympathetic to what we might call traditionalist values, traditionalist family structures, traditionalist social structures, and so forth. So that, I'm not talking specifically about the court right now, but if you want to know what left and right or liberal and conservative mean in US politics, that's, I think, the, a, a fair way to describe it. Again, it's complicated. There are some people who are very conservative in economic issues, but very liberal when it comes to issues of things like gay rights, for example, or, or uh, racial equality. So it's not, so, but that's the basic lineup. In the US, the Democratic Party, the party of our current president, Joe Biden, is typically associated more with the left part of the political spectrum, and the Republican Party is typically more associated with the right part of the political spectrum. 
if you look at the core and you look at these contested cases, the, the five, four cases or the six, three cases, and you look at the party of the president who appointed the justices on each side of those disputes, it's rather striking that especially more recently, there used to be more exceptions to this, but more recently, you can predict things pretty well by whether the appointing president of that justice was a Republican and therefore more on the right or a Democrat and more on the left. So, so that's what left and right mean in US politics and there's a lot of evidence, I think pretty straightforwardly, that those kinds of left-right ideas affect the way judges and justices think about um, hard cases. But there are also differences among the justices that have to do with legal philosophies, interpretive theories, and so forth, that sometimes seem to line up with a left-right liberal conservative distinction, but don't necessarily do so automatically or, or sort of straightforwardly. So for example, um, in constitutional interpretation, one school of thought known as originalism um, holds that when interpreting the Constitution, what one ought to do is to try to figure out what the document would have meant at the time that it was written and ratified. And that the Constitution does not protect rights or create obligations or impose limitations that the those who wrote and ratified the relevant constitutional provisions would not have understood those provisions to create. Uh, with respect to the original public meaning of the words. Other schools of thought are non-originalist, right? So there's not like one alternative, but sometimes called a, a living constitution view. There are other views as well that suggest that while original meaning or original understanding might be relevant in constitutional interpretation, other factors are important as well. And they'll even point out that the people who wrote and ratified the Constitution expected it as a Constitution to be an evolving document whose meaning would be worked out or liquidated is the language, the old fashioned language they would sometimes use over time. So today in the United States, originalism is very much associated with the right wing of the political spectrum. The leading originalist thinkers are also conservatives, and um, non-originalists tend to be on the left wing. It's not clear whether that's inevitable, and recently, some people on the left have said there's a version of kind of left wing originalism that they invoke to counter what they see as move on the right to become more and more non-originalist, especially as um, the, the right wing has become more powerful on the Supreme Court, you see a younger generation of conservative legal thinkers saying, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so bound by a narrow understanding of original intent. Maybe the liberals were right all along that originalism is not a coherent philosophy and we should be more willing to read in conservative values into the Constitution, just like we've been saying liberals have been reading their liberal values into the Constitution. That relates to another axis of division that does not map neatly onto left versus right, and that's what you might call judicial activism versus judicial restraint. And it relates to what I said earlier in the talk about some people have this idea that when an issue is a hard issue, a politically contested issue, courts should, to the extent that they can, stay out and defer to the judgments of the other branches of government versus the view that no, courts can take a more active role in making sure that everyone else stays in compliance with the law. So judicial activism versus judicial restraint does not map neatly onto liberal versus conservative. And in fact, you see some interesting reversals and re-reversals over US history. So back at, in the earlier part of the 20th century, especially during um, the so-called New Deal period where President Franklin Roosevelt was pushing for a much more active role for the federal government in addressing uh, econ not just economic inequality, but, but failures of the market in, in the wake of the Great Depression, um, a conservative Supreme Court initially struck down a lot of President Roosevelt's initiatives. And at the time, you would see famous liberal jurists like Oliver Wendell Holmes or Louis Brandeis calling for judicial restraint and it was the conservative wing that was viewed as activist. And they would have said, I think that, well, we're defending the liberty, the economic liberty provisions of the Constitution. In the 1950s and 1960s, you started to see a reversal because at that point, the federal courts, including the Supreme Court, became more active in defending uh, the political and civil rights of traditionally disadvantaged groups, especially, though not exclusively, uh, black Americans. 
And this was met with great resistance, especially but not exclusively in the southern part of the United States where legal segregation had persisted longer. And you see the emergence of a rhetoric opposing so-called judicial activism and encouraging judicial restraint emerging on the right side of the political spectrum where a new generation of liberal uh, legal theorists and jurists kind of constructed theories to justify judicial intervention. So we got this reversal. And I think right now we're seeing a reversal again, where now that we have a more, uh, a, a stronger conservative majority in the Supreme Court, you will often see liberal justices and commentators objecting to what the court is doing as being overreaching and excessively activist, and a new younger generation of conservative commentators being much more comfortable with this. Um, finally, I'll say, uh, in terms of these issues of judicial philosophy, you mentioned purposivism and, and textualism. This relates to, for those of you who are going to be participating in the Supreme Court uh, decision-making seminar that I'm going to be running this semester, the first case we're going to talk about deals with these issues. But in, in the construction of statutes, one view, when you're trying to figure out what does a law mean, and the, this is an issue that's not unique to the United States. I'm sure the Thai courts deal with this as well. You have a, you have a code, right? You have a statute, and you have a case. And there's a question about, well, does the statute as written cover this case? And situations come up where the literal meaning, or at least the usual linguistic meaning of the words in the statute would seem to indicate one a, a certain outcome for the case, but that seems to be in tension with the purposes for which the statute was enacted or what the lawmakers were probably trying to accomplish. They, maybe they would have thought about this case, you see this tension quite a lot. A lot of the cases that come before courts, including the Supreme Court, have this tension. So people who are more textualist in their orientation say, we need to follow the meaning of the language. We need to do what the language instructs us to do. Um, we are not legislators. We are not here to correct the legislature's mistakes or uh, do what we think they might have wanted to do. We, the courts, are bound to follow the law as written. Whereas non-textualist interpreters, sometimes we call them purposivist interpreters, will say, we should pay attention to the text, of course, because the text is usually the best indication of what the legislators meant to do, but ultimately legislation is enacted for some purpose. And we need to try to figure out what that purpose is and not read statutes in a narrow, literalistic way that would produce a result contrary to the purposes of the legislation or the legislators who enacted it. Today, I think it's fair, and for the last generation, I think it's fair to say that a more textualist approach to inter interpretation has been championed by the conservative wing of the court, and a more purposeless approach to interpretation has been championed by a more, the, the more uh, liberal, aggressive wing of the court. But again, we see evidence from the last couple of terms that it's more complicated than that, and that these, uh, and there's been, there have been some shifts. So recently, some of the leading voices on the liberal wing of the court, including, for example, my former teacher and former boss, Elena Kagan, has denounced her conservative colleagues for straying from textualism when textualism would lead to a non-conservative outcome. So she is basically saying, I'm more textualist than, than you guys are. I'll stick to the text, um, read sensibly, not narrowly, and you will say you're textualist, but you actually deviate from that language. So I think, um, and again, if you look historically, textualism is not always associated with conservatism. So I think that's more of a historically contingent phenomenon. I realize I'm giving you a very long answer to the question, but I think it's important to understand this because as a first cut, it's fair to say that the court has a conservative wing and a liberal wing, and the conservatives are originalist and textualist, and the liberals are purposivist and non-originalist. And again, that's not wrong exactly. If you have that view, you know, you'll, you'll predict the way the ju justices will come out a pretty high percentage of the time, but especially for law students and legal thinkers, it's a bit too simple to think about things in that way. If you get into the nuances, it's, it, it's more, complicated and some of these legal interpretive philosophies are associated with certain political inclinations, maybe more by accident than by some kind of logical or philosophical necessity. Uh, following up on what you have mentioned that each justice has different ideologies that they are inclined to and that may in turn affect the decision making process. I'm wondering 
what are the process of um, selecting the justices? Are there any uh, mechanism that would balance out the ideologies and make it less political? And what do you make of such selection process? Great. So um, the appointments clause, the so-called appointments clause of the United States Constitution says that justices of the Supreme Court, as well as other federal judges and other uh, uh, government officials, ambassadors, and so forth, are to be uh, nominated by the President of the United States and then appointed to their positions with the advice and consent of the Senate. That phrase, advice and consent of the Senate, has been consistently interpreted to mean that the Senate votes to confirm the President's nominee. So it is a political process, unlike other countries that have a kind of council of judges or whether the legal profession generates a short list or has a more direct formal role in the selection. In the United States, under our Constitution, the president uh, selects nominees, and those nominees are appointed to the court if they are confirmed by the Senate. So that's constant over time. That's the constitutional system. Now, the way in which that happens and the informal norms that attach to this process can vary and have varied over time. So um, today, there are public hearings that ever, anyone can watch, and you can watch recordings of them. And so you might think that that's always been the way that it was, but that's not true. There are long periods of history where there, there were not public hearings on Supreme Court nominees where the nominees answer questions. Um, that process with the television cameras rolling sometimes has led, leads some people to think it makes the process more political uh, because the senators who are asking questions have an incentive to ask questions in a certain way that emphasize political is issues that their constituents care about. So that's certainly a difference. Um, the amount of information that we have about the justices or the judicial nominees uh, today is much greater than it was maybe 100 years ago. I don't want to say the appointments process 100 years ago was not political. Of, of course it was. I think it kind of always has been, at least once people figured out the Supreme Court was kind of an important institution. But it's just very different when uh, people have extensive track records and paper trails and articles and speeches and there are professional staffs that can do research on the nominees and dig into everything about them. We know a lot about these people. And chances are for anyone of sufficient stature to be nominated to the Supreme Court, they, they've had a professional career. They have history. Um, it's also the case, of course, that because, as we were discussing before, the US Supreme Court today weighs in on so many important high profile topics. And because once a justice is appointed, there's very little you can do. It, it is possible to impeach and remove a Supreme Court justice, but it doesn't happen. It's extraordinarily difficult. Um, there's a lot more concern among all parties involved to figure out what a justice's views are likely to be before you put that justice on the court. Because once they're there, there's not, not, nothing you can do, really. And they can be there for a long, long time. I think we shouldn't understate the importance of simple things like increased life expectancy over the last 100 years on the impact that the justices can have. I mean, people can serve on the court for 40 years sometimes. Um, that was the case, I believe, of Justice Douglas. So. I'm not sure, given our current structure, there's really a way to make the process um, less political without some kind of serious constitutional change. I also mentioned norms. This is another place where we've seen some change. So it used to be the case. I don't, again, I don't want to make it seem like too romanticized in the past. There, throughout the US history, there's always been controversy of the Supreme Court. But I think there was maybe more of a sense a generation or two ago that members of the Senate would be generally deferential to the president's selections as long as those selections were roughly within the mainstream of American law and politics. If they were competent jurists, if they didn't have any serious ethical blemishes, if they seemed intelligent and have what we sometimes call a judicial temperament, then the thinking was, even if you're a Republican, you'll vote to appoint a Democratic nominee who you might not think is great, but with the understanding that if the Democrats will vote to confirm a Republican, Republican nominee, uh, even if they're not great. And I do think that has broken down. Uh, you still see sometimes at the Court of Appeals level, sometimes 
overwhelming lopsided majorities confirming a presidential nominee, but these days you're much more likely to see like 52 to 48 votes, right? 51 to 49 votes or whatever, or very much on party lines. So I do think um, that that's a difference. And both parties blame the other for starting it. And I have my own views about this, but they're not important enough for, for me to share. But I do, I do think there has been a breakdown um, in that sense. And that's something that both uh, liberal justices and conservative justices have bemoaned. They, they don't, the justices don't like how, I think, hyper-partisan the, the confirmation process has become. Uh, they all had to go through it, and I think none of them enjoyed it. Uh, they really like the image of the court as not completely apolitical, but in some sense above politics and more dignified than politics. So I think they don't really like it very much. It's a, it's a problem, but I'm not sure it's one that has an easy solution. All right, so let's talk more about the court itself. So the court hears cases and controversies according to the Constitution. So how do the U.S. Supreme Court uh, the, how do cases go to the U.S. Supreme Court? So is it only federal law case, or is it also state law case? And also whether is it only like constitutional law case or other areas of law also? Great, so the U.S. Supreme Court is the court of last resort for federal law. Occasionally the Supreme Court will have to issue opinions regarding state law in the course of resolving some issue of federal law, or in some cases the court needs to decide whether some state law violates federal statutory or constitutional law. But typically on matters of purely state law, uh, where there's no issue about whether the state law would violate the federal constitution or a federal statute, those issues are left up to the Supreme Courts in each individual state. So my home state, the state of Massachusetts, has the Massachusetts State Supreme Court. The state of New York has the New York Supreme Court. The state of California has the California Supreme Court. And the US is a, a federalist system with you know, federal law on top, but then state law. And so if there's no issue of federal law involved, the Supreme Court, does, US Supreme Court, the federal Supreme Court doesn't really take the case. Um, with respect to issues of federal law, the Supreme Court is not limited to issues of constitutional law. I think sometimes people get the impression that the Supreme Court is essentially a constitutional court, partly because many of the Supreme Court's highest profile, most famous cases involve rulings on constitutional law, and partly because in many countries there is a separate constitutional court which is distinct from the ordinary court of last resort. So I think these two things together sometimes lead people outside the US system to, to just imagine the US Supreme Court must be a constitutional court. But that's not right. In fact, many of the Supreme Court's most important and in some sense most controversial cases over the last several years were not constitutional cases, at least not directly. Um, I'll mention a couple that we're going to cover in the, in the Supreme Court decision-making seminar that I hope some of you will be participating in here at Chul Lungkorn. There was a recent case about whether a, a statutory provision that makes it unlawful for a, a, an employer, including a private employer, to discriminate against any employee on the basis of that employee's sex prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. There was no constitutional issue in that case, at least not directly, because it involves a statutory regulation of private actors, not state actors. And the Constitution's provisions on equality, the Equal Protection Clause, for example, limit what state actors can do. The federal government or the state governments, they don't limit what private employers can do. It's a little, there are some complications and exceptions, but in broad terms, that's right. And so that case, which was a very important, very controversial case about uh, gay rights and transgender rights, was not a constitutional case, it was a statutory case. Another one of the cases that we're gonna be talking about in the seminar, dealing with another very important controversial issue, had to do with the court's ruling on the Obama administration's plan to reduce carbon emissions to fight global climate change as part of its clean power plan. The issue in that case was whether the um, Federal Environmental Protection Agency had the authority under the statute, the Clean Air Act, to implement as ambitious and sweeping a rule as it did. Now there's some background constitutional atmosphere 
that affects the case because the court indicated there were some concerns, constitutional concerns, about reading a statute to delegate extensive powers to Congress. But at least with respect to the majority opinion, the concurrence was a little bit different, but at least with respect to the majority opinion, it's decided as a statutory case, a case about administrative law, not about constitutional law. So um, this is, a, I'm giving a very long, the simple way to answer your question is no, it's not just constitutional law, but I wanted to explain a little bit more. The US Supreme Court decides important cases and some unimportant cases of federal law, um, not just constitutional law. And as the Supreme Court does not hear many cases, but instead the justices only selected a number of cases for the oral argument. So how do the justices decide which cases to hear? It's a, it's a great question. This is another important thing about the US Supreme Court that makes it different from some Supreme Courts in other parts of the world. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know enough about the Thai system, but there are systems in which you have an automatic right to appeal to the Supreme Court. If you lose at the Court of Appeals level, you can appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court gets thousands, decides, actually decides thousands and thousands of cases every year, often by single justices or like they have big professional staffs because there's an enormous caseload. Um, the US Supreme Court is not like that. The US Supreme Court has what's sometimes called a discretionary docket, mostly. As with everything I'm saying, it's more complicated. There are exceptions. There are certain kinds of cases that the court must hear that are part of its original jurisdiction. So if one state sues another state, that can go straight to the Supreme Court. When I was a clerk at the court, there was one particular case I remember. It was the state of Arizona versus the state of Colorado. The, uh, the case had been going on for decades, and it had to do with water rights for the Colorado River. Right? And the states had a dispute about control of the water. That went right to the Supreme Court. But the vast majority of the Supreme Court's docket today are cases that were initially decided below, either at the federal court of appeals level or sometimes at a state Supreme Court if the issue raised a federal constitutional issue. And then the court granted one party's petition to hear the case. So the way that this works, if we put aside the special original jurisdiction cases, is that let's say you're in federal court and let's say you lose. You lose the trial level, you appeal. You have an appeal as of right to the courts of appeals, the intermediate level, and let's say you lose there too. You then can file a petition with the US Supreme Court, which is called a petition for a writ of certiorari, some fancy Latin there, which basically means to certify the case to the Supreme Court. For short, if you ever hear this language, it's called a cert petition. So people talk about petitioning for cert or seeking cert. So the, so the Supreme Court gets hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of cert petitions every year, and they need to decide which ones to hear. So under the court's current rules, this is not in the Constitution, this is the court's own rules, there's what's called the rule of four. If four of the justices, usually four of the nine justices, uh, if there's a full complement, vote to take the case, then the petition for a writ of certiorari or a cert petition is granted. And then that case puts on the court, gets put on the court's calendar, there's briefing, there's argument, and eventually a decision by the full court. If not, then cert is denied. And if cert is denied, that's it. You lost. You lost at the trial court level, you lost at the court of appeals level, you petitioned for cert, the court said no, you're done. So then the question is, well, how does the court decide which cases Get, a, get, get the cert petition. It's sometimes called which cases are cert worthy. Like among the clerks, that's not like public conversation, but the, the clerks and the justices would sometimes use the language, this is a cert worthy case. So, so how does the court select it? Because again, I forget the numbers now, but hundreds and hundreds of, of cert petitions, the court only hears maybe 70 cases a year. It might even be a little bit lower now. How do they choose? How, how do they decide? How do the justices decide? Are they gonna vote yes or no when they're voting in conference? Well, there are a few factors that uh, the, the court takes very seriously about whether it should hear a case. First, if the case raises a legal issue that has divided the courts of appeals, then that doesn't guarantee the court will take the case, but it substantially increases the chance the court will take the case. This is what's sometimes called a circuit split. So, as some of you may know, the United States federal judiciary is organized with the Supreme Court on top, but then with 12 circuits, is what they're called. They're basically judicial districts. Um, 
They're called circuits, by the way, because back in the, back in the old days, the justices wouldn't necessarily sit just in one courthouse. They'd ride on a circuit, like they'd get on their horses and they'd kind of ride from place to place to hear appeals that were happening in different places. So that a circuit, today we think about electronics, but a circuit just means to go in a circle. So they'd, like, they'd ride around and the different circuits were the different routes. And so they're, they're mostly geographic, except there's one that hears, a spe hears mostly patent and, and trade cases. So the same case, raising the same legal issue, can come up in different circuits. And if those different circuits resolve the issue the same way, then the Supreme Court might think, well, there's no real reason for us to take the case because the courts of appeals all seem to be in agreement on that. That's kind of a signal that they probably got it right, uh, especially if it's a more technical legal issue in which the ju justices don't have strong views. But if the first circuit, which includes my home state of Massachusetts as well as other states in New England, reaches one conclusion, and the Second Circuit, which includes New York, for example, reaches the opposite conclusion, then federal law means different things in different parts of the country. Or if there's a long-standing circuit split, you might have four or five circuits that come out one way and another three or four circuits that come out the other way. Those cases, the Supreme Court will say, basically, we need to resolve this issue of federal law. It's not a great thing if the same federal law means different things in different parts of the country, so we need to weigh in to resolve that. So if you are filing your petition for cert in the US Supreme Court, one of the things that you will try to do, that the lawyers try to do, is show there's a circuit split. And they try, even when there's not really, they, they try to make it look like there is because it increases the chance the court will take the case. A second thing that may lead the court to take the case is if a lower court invalidates a federal statute or some other important government action on federal constitutional grounds. The court might feel like we need to intercede quickly in that case because we need to resolve whether in fact this statute is constitutional or not. So sometimes the court won't wait for a circuit split to develop on an issue like that. Sometimes the issue just seems to be of such important consequence, it's so important and it's a pressing urgent issue the court feels like we need to intervene on this issue right away. Uh, because it's time sensitive or very high profile. So that's, those are the criteria. Now in terms of the, the internal process, the, the law clerks actually, and I used to be one of them, are, are quite involved in this part of the process. Because of course, the justices are the ones who vote whether to grant the cert petition or not. The clerks don't do that. We're not even in the room when that happens. But the clerks are kind of like the first line of defense or the first screeners in highlighting which cases might be cert work. So when I, would, when I was a law clerk and I would come into my office in the morning, one of the first things that I would often have to do is there would be a big pile on my desk of cert petitions and I would start going through them. And I, for every one, I would write a memo, not just for my justice, but for all the justices on the court because we divided the cert petitions up among the various clerks in the various chambers so it wouldn't overwhelm any one person. I would write up a memo to all the justices about what the case was about and what the legal issue was and why the losing party had petitioned for cert and whether it seemed to be a case that the court should grant. And because I was writing for all nine justices, not just the justice that I was working for, I needed to keep in mind that I wasn't supposed to be reflecting my individual boss's view, not just Justice Kennedy's view, but, but generally the criteria the court cares about. Most of these memos were very short, maybe half a page, right? They would often say something like, the petitioner is a federal prisoner who claims that uh, his lawyer was ineffective at the trial, depriving him of his right to a fair trial. The case is fact-bound, that's one of the, the the language would often appear basically means it doesn't raise a real legal issue, it just has to do with the facts of the case. The Supreme Court often thinks we're not really here to do fact stuff, we're here to do law stuff. Um, no circuit split, mere error correction. You might say mere error correction, shouldn't the court be correcting errors? But the Supreme Court does have this idea that of course they're there to potentially correct like big errors, major constitutional cases, but there are thousands and thousands of judicial decisions every year by the lower courts of appeals we hope that most of them are right. Some of them are likely to be wrong. The Supreme Court's attitude is our job is not really to correct every mistake that happens below. So I'd write a lot of these memos. My colleagues would write a lot of these memos that would say splitless fact-bound error correction I recommend deny after a paragraph summarizing the facts of the case. But sometimes you're going through the pile and you're like, whoa, this one's kind of hard, right? There's actually, there's a serious um, 
uh, memo filed with the petition for cert. It says there's a circuit split. The other side files a response, says there's no real circuit split. That the, and then, as a clerk, I'd have to do some research, right? I'd have to read the cases, I'd have to look at them carefully, I'd have to think about the criteria that I was just explaining to the Supreme Court thinks of as important, and write a memo, and that memo might be two, three, four, five, six pages long. It might still, in the end, recommend denying the case. It might recommend granting the case. Um, sometimes we would recommend calling for the views of the United States Solicitor General, but the US government, if the US government thought this was a case the court should take. Um, sometimes, if only the petitioner had filed a memo, we might call for a response by the other party. But, but those are the hard ones. Those are the ones that, that took up time. So I hope that answers your question. That's, that's the basic process. And then after the clerks write their memos, they're circulated to the justices. The justices read them. The justices might discuss particular cases of interest with their clerks. And then on a regular basis, the justices would meet in conference, and they would go down the list. They wouldn't discuss every case, but any justice could put a case on the so-called discuss list. And if a case is on the discuss list, if your justice hadn't flagged it, then you'd pull the memo that the other law clerk had written, you'd maybe write a memo for your own justice, and then they would go in and decide whether they're gonna vote to grant the case or deny the case. All right, just to follow up on that, so that's all about the criteria, right? What about like, for example, do you, does, the, does the Supreme Court have some kind of theme in each year, whether to grant like admin law case more than others, con law case more than others? No. Con rights case? No, no. Um, I do think some justices have particular interests in certain areas and are kind of waiting for a case. Like sometimes you see the justices, especially if they think they have a majority on their side, almost invite litigants, like please bring a petition for this kind of case. But like they don't have themes. It's not like, like this is gonna be our you know, administrative law year or this is gonna be our Title VII year or whatever. They don't do that. Um, the, the cases kind of bubble up to them. I mean, they're, I wouldn't describe them as passive exactly, but they're sort of reactive in the sense that the case flow is initiated by litigants and then decisions by the courts of appeals. And so, um, yeah, some justices might have an inclination there are certain kinds of cases they, they want to take and will be looking for those cases. Um, but it's not like they have like collective themes. Sometimes, this is sort of important to know, the justices won't say this out loud, but many scholars have, have argued, I think fairly persuasively, that sometimes justices will deliberately not take a case that raises an issue that they're interested in because the case isn't in a great posture or doesn't have great facts for them. It's sometimes they say whether this is a good vehicle to deal with this particular legal issue. So. You know, if you're a justice, you're being kind of strategic about this, and you're very simple, you're interested in a particular kind of change in the law, you might want to wait for a case that has very sympathetic facts for your side, or where the legal issue is very clear and clean and it would be difficult to resolve the case on other narrower grounds, for, for instance. So I think the justices do think about that. Um, they wouldn't even say to their clerks they're thinking about that. I just think it's in their heads. Uh, that that's, that's a consideration. But no, they, they don't have particular themes uh, for, like, for the whole term. Thank you. So uh, let's talk about more about the decision-making process in the judgment. So as you mentioned, uh, cases in Supreme Court are often hard cases. There are disagreements, variety of degrees. So how do the US Supreme Court justice settle down their disagreement and decide which is gonna be the majority opinion, which gets, which, who gets to write the dissent, and so forth? Great, so, so let me talk a little bit about the mechanics of the process. So if uh, cert is granted in the case, it's on the argument calendar, and before the case is argued, the parties will submit their briefs. The petitioner will submit a brief, the respondents will submit a brief, the petitioners may sometimes have a reply brief, there will also be called what are sometimes what are sometimes called amicus briefs. Amicus is short for amicus curiae, which is Latin for friend of the court. So an amicus, a uh, friend of the court, is a party that's not directly in the case. They're neither the petitioner nor the respondent, but they have an interest in the case. Amicus, amicus briefs happen at the court of appeals level. They're not that common at the Supreme Court level in a high profile case. Maybe it'll be 30, 40, 50 amicus briefs filed. Um, but before the oral argument, the justices, aided by their clerks, will prepare. They'll read the briefs, they'll do more research, they might ask their clerks to write a memo on the case or memo about specific aspects of the case, and they'll go into the case, I think, with 
at least an initial sense of which way they think they're going to vote. Now again, for, for high profile issues where like they have very strong feelings, you know, abortion cases or, or whatever, it's very rare that the briefs or the oral argument will change their mind. But again, as I said in my opening remarks, there are a bunch of cases where they don't necessarily have strong views and they might really be looking at the briefs and think, listening to the lawyers to try to figure out what they think about the case. But there'll, there'll be the oral argument and the, just, the, the lawyers will stand up and they'll make a presentation to the court and the justices will interrupt them and ask questions. I don't know if any of you have ever, um, you can't watch, there are no cameras in the courtroom, but seen a transcript of a Supreme Court oral argument or heard a recording. Uh, the lawyers don't get to just stand up there and speak uninterrupted for half an hour. Often they get as far as may it please the court and immediately there's an interruption uh, and the justices will ask them questions. Sometimes the justices are kind of grandstanding and kind of making a point to their colleagues. Sometimes the justices are genuinely confused about something or uncertain about a point and are asking the lawyers to kind of help them out. All right, so that's the oral argument. After the oral argument, in, in the, it's sort of month, there's a monthly calendar, but it, after that month's set of cases has been argued, the judges will meet in what's called conference. They'll meet in conference. Only the justices are allowed to be in that room. There are no aides, there's no staff, there's no nothing, just the nine of them. And then they will go around and have a preliminary vote on which way they intend to, to vote in the, in the case. That first vote is not necessarily binding. Justices sometimes do change their mind. But for purposes of assigning the opinion, that will, say, that will show how many people are on each side. Now, it has sometimes in the past been the case that these conference discussions would have, the justices would give long speeches, they'd, they'd argue with each other, there'd be exchanges, it could go on for hours and hours. This is no longer the case. I think the justices figured out this was extremely inefficient and you know, not a good use of their time. Usually each justice will say like two or three sentences. I'm told, again, I've never been in the room, but what, I, what I'm told is they'll go around and everyone will say like, I plan to affirm because blah, blah, blah. And the next will say, I intend to vote to reverse, blah, blah, blah. And typically the, um, I'm trying to remember the order. It's, it's from senior to junior, junior to senior. I'm trying to remember which way. Um, I can't remember. Uh, it'll come to me perhaps, but they, there's a particular order of voting. After the, the, the initial vote is concluded, the most senior justice in the majority assigns the opinion. And just to be clear, the chief justice is always considered the most senior justice, even if the chief justice hasn't been on the court as long as other justices. So in other words, if the chief justice is in the majority, the chief justice will assign the opinion. If the chief justice, and can assign the opinion to him, himself if he wants, uh, and sometimes does. If the chief justice is not in the majority, then the most senior justice in the majority will assign the opinion. So how does the chief justice assign the opinion? Well, it's up to him or her, although all our chief justices so far have been hymns. We hope this will change sometime in the future. Um, the chief justice will take into account, you want to kind of even the workload among the justices, right? So we might think, well, it's all political and who will write the opinion in what way, that's important. I'm gonna say something about that in a moment. But also, well, the justices are supposed to have a roughly even number of opinions. So the chief will keep track of who has how many opinions. And if one justice already has been assigned three opinions and another justice hasn't been assigned any, then maybe the second justice will get the, the next one. Sometimes chief justices will assign opinions to themselves because they really want it. Um, a lot of the big constitutional cases dealing with separation of powers the, and the role of the, the president, the Congress, and the judiciary, chief justices tend to write a disproportionately large number of those opinions and many people suspect it's because chief justices like the idea that they're the last word on those big issues. Sometimes if your majority coalition is narrow, you might assign the opinion to the, the waiver one, the one in the middle. So this happens less often now that you have more 6-3 decisions. But back when I was on the court, I was clerking for Justice Kennedy. And when I was there, uh, there was a wing of the court. There were four justices who were considered the liberal wing of the court. There were three justices who were considered staunchly, reliably conservative and, and mostly down the line. And then there were two justices, Justice O'Connor and my boss, Justice Kennedy, who were more on the conservative end, 
but who were a little bit more moderate. If Again, if I can use that political language, understanding it's a bit of an oversimplification. And, it's, and in the five, four cases, the really close ones, Justice Kennedy and Justice O'Connor got a lot of those cases. And they got a lot of those cases because if they had voted with the liberal block, right, uh, if one of them had sort of defected, if you will, from the five justice conservative coalition to vote with the liberals, Justice Stevens, who was the most senior liberal justice at the time, would want to assign the opinion to whoever it was, Justice Kennedy or Justice O'Connor, to not lose them. You're less likely to lose a justice who wrote the opinion than someone else, right? Because you know that the other uh, 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 group is going to be trying to peel them off. So, so that's kind of how the opinion assignment process works. Now, what about dissents or concurrences? It's a bit more informal. Typically, the justices on the dissenting side will talk amongst themselves and say, like, who, who wants to write the lead dissent in this case? Um, now, what happens after? Because that's not the end, right? That's the initial straw poll. But I just said that's not final. Justices can and do change their minds. Not often, but it happens. So typically what happens is the justice who's been assigned the opinion will go back to chambers and write a draft of the opinion in the case. Different justices do this different ways. Different justices use their clerks in different ways. Some justices ask a clerk to write a first draft of the opinion. And then they, with, with specific instructions for how to do it, but the clerks are kind of the initial drafters. Other justices do all their own writing from scratch. Um, for other justices, it's a mix. But however the process works, a draft majority opinion is prepared and then circulated to all of the chambers. And then if there's a dissent or a concurrence or a concurrence in the judgment of the case, that gets circulated as well. And then justices can join. So the simplest thing that happens is a join memo. Uh, you circulate, so if, if I was the clerk on the case, I'd be responsible as, along with the administrative staff for sending out the draft opinion to the chambers. And then you'd sit there waiting for your join memos. And you're really happy when you just get a memo that says, I am pleased to join your excellent opinion in Smith versus Jones. And like, Yay, we got that one. Sometimes you'll get a, a memo that says, uh, I'm still inclined to join your opinion, but I have some concerns. And sometimes they'll say in the memo, here's what my concerns are. Sometimes there will be oral exchanges, maybe directly between the justices, but maybe between the clerks. One thing that the clerks do is we're kind of like ambassadors, if you will, between the chambers. We can sometimes chat about what the concerns are and see if we can work things out uh, to save our bosses some time. Sometimes if a dissent goes around, a justice in the majority might waver um, and switch sides. And then a dissenting opinion can become a majority opinion. That happens sometimes as well. Sometimes when after the majority, the justice writing majority opinion sees the dissent and sees the memos from their colleagues, they might modify the majority opinion to respond to the dissent. If you ever see a Supreme Court opinion, if you ever read a Supreme Court opinion, sometimes the majority will say in the main text or a footnote, the dissent argues blah, 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 but actually blah, blah, blah. Um, well, that was obviously not in the first draft of the majority opinion. There is a response. Now you might say, well, couldn't this go on forever where people keep responding to each other back and forth? In theory, yes. In practice, no. There's a kind of informal understanding. You go back and forth a couple of times, then you have the main points out there. and We're not going to debate this like back and forth with answers to answers to answers to answers to answers forever. Usually there's a couple of rounds of back and backs and forth. In, a, in the harder cases, in the more contested cases, it may be longer. People might be much more particular about the details of the language that's used, how certain cases are cited, um, and so forth. Uh, but basically, eventually, the process ends, and then the opinions are released. Uh, and they're released all the way up until June, when the court's, the court's term officially begins in October, famously the first Monday in October, and then ends at the end of June. And then the last opinions come out, and then we're done until October when we start again. And then over the summer, there's still work going on. The justices all go on vacation and give lectures in fancy places. But the clerks show up, and they immediately start processing the cert petitions for the next round. OK, so now let's touch upon the clerkship. As you used to be the clerk in the Supreme Court, could you explain the roles of the clerk and the work that you had been doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And also, how are the clerks got selected? And what are the relationships between the clerk and the justices? 
Oh, great. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. In terms of the selection process, it's like applying for a job, right? So you, you send in uh, your resume, your law school transcripts, letters of recommendation from your professors or the judge that you've clerked for if you've already done a clerkship, um, and then you hope. And if you're lucky, you'll get a kind of a first round interview. Some justices uh, go right to interviewing a very large number of clerkship candidates themselves. Other justices have a preliminary screening interview that's done by often a former clerk of the justice who's now a relatively experienced lawyer uh, or judge themselves who will do the first round screening interview. So that was my case just with Justice Kennedy. My first round was I went down to Washington, D.C. to do a screening interview with a partner at a D.C. law firm who was one of Justice Kennedy's former clerks who Justice Kennedy trusted very much to figure out. Not everyone who gets, who gets to do these things is smart. Like there's lots of smart law school graduates. So the screeners are not just looking for, is this person smart? Uh, but they're looking for, uh, is this person a good fit for the justice? Um, and then you can do another round of interviews with the justice, and you interview with the justice's current clerks, and you interview with the justice, and some of them ask you really tough probing questions about law. Others, they want to just get a sense of your personality and your interests. And then if you're lucky, uh, you get hired. And it's really, um, it's really a lottery, right? There, there are so many extremely talented law school graduates from top law schools every year with excellent credentials, and the justices typically hire only four clerks each. When I was there, the chief justice only hired three. So there are not that many slots, and you just kind of have to hope that everything breaks the right way. Um, that's, that's the hiring process. I mean, there's no, there's no like secret magic to it. Just you send in your resume, you hope you get an interview, you hope you do well in the interview, and then you hope you get the job. In terms of the relationship between the, the um, justices and the clerks, it's such a small office, right? It's, it's the justice and then the administrative staff uh, and then the four clerks. It really depends on the personality of the justice, like what the relationships are like. Some people are very formal. Some people are much more informal. I'm sure uh, many of you may have had this experience with some of the professors or maybe other people that you've worked with. Some people have a very formal demeanor, and they might be very friendly, they might be very good bosses, but like, they're not people you would joke around with, right? They're not people, like, they're, it's just a much more formal relationship, they have a more formal style. Other people have a much more informal, casual style, um, and so the relationship between the justices and the clerks, I think, really varies based on the personality of the justices. I, I noticed this even more at the Court of Appeals level where there's a larger number of judges and, and I, I felt like some judges and their clerks, the relationship was like the professor and her research assistants. Some, the relationship was more like the law firm partner and her associates. Some, the relationship was more like the uncle or aunt and the you know, favorite nieces or nephews and they'd all like go out to dinner together. It's just so variable depending on the personality of the, of, of the particular person that you're working with. In terms of the work of the clerk, the day-to-day -day work of the clerk, I've already touched on a bit of this, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about your job. So here are a few things that you do. Screening cert petitions. In terms of the workload, that's a big chunk of it. Right? The ju not just your justice, but all the justices are relying on the clerks to do a good, professional, careful, conscientious job of helping the justices sift through these hundreds and hundreds of cases and find the ones the court should take. When the briefs come in, justices do this different, different ways, but most justices will ask their clerk on the case to write a bench memo. By the way, uh, the clerks divide up the cases. So there are four clerks and every round, there'd be, let's say, eight cases on the calendar for the month, you know, October, November, what it would be. We would divide up the cases. How did we divide up the cases? Well, this is just the way our chambers did it. I don't know about other chambers. We had like a draft pick system. There would be, uh, and it would rotate every month. So one person would get the first and the eighth pick. One person would get the second and the seventh pick, right? Third, uh, third and sixth, fourth and fifth. And then we'd rotate every month to try to keep it fair because some cases are really exciting and really fun. And some cases, like I said earlier in my remarks, it's still the Supreme Court, right? It's still cool, but they're kind of boring. Like, they're not really super exciting cases. Um, so we just have, like, this draft pick system. Before the oral argument in your case, you write a memo to the justice. 
what you think about the case. What are the hard issues? Did you, the parties cited these cases, the precedents, you looked them up as the clerk. You would tell the justice, I think the citations are accurate. I think maybe they're not quite accurate. I think the earlier cases didn't resolve this issue clearly, do that. You would also help prepare your justice for the oral argument by suggesting questions that the justice might ask at oral arguments. And the justices would often not ask the questions that you had carefully and meticulously researched and drafted. But the hope is it was still helpful to the justice in thinking through uh, the arguments they wanted to um, raise to the lawyers. After the oral argument, if your justice was assigned the opinion or a dissent or has decided that he or she wants to concur separately, then if you're the clerk on the case, you're the principal drafter of that, or the principal assistant. Again, some justices have their clerks act as drafters, some as assistants. But you're the kind of lead clerk for helping prepare the opinion in your chambers on that case and in talking to the clerks in the other chambers who are assigned that case. So, if I was the clerk on a case that Justice Kennedy was writing, I would be Justice Kennedy's principal assistant for drafting that case. I would also be the person that the clerks in other chambers would talk to if they had issues or concerns about the opinion. If some other justice was assigned my case, then I wouldn't be the principal drafter, but I would be the person who was supposed to be talking to the clerk who was the principal assistant drafting that case. So um, that's the other big part of the job is, is being able to assist with the drafting process. And also, if you were not, um, if your chambers wasn't drafting the case and the, and the um, opinion came around, your justice might ask for your advice about whether he or she should join the opinion. Now, you don't get to decide, right? They'll decide, but they might say, can you, can you read Justice O'Connor's opinion in the Smith versus Jones case? and write me a memo about whether you think I should join it as is or whether uh, there are issues or concerns that you would want to raise with me that you would want me to raise with Justice O'Connor, for example. So those are the main things. There are other things that clerks do. Sometimes uh, if the justice is giving a speech, uh, then the, they might ask the clerk for help drafting the speech if they're talking to a group of law students, for example, or, or giving a speech in honor of, of, of some person. They might ask for some background research. Um, one of the uh, highest pressure things you might have to do as a, law, uh, as a law clerk is help handle emergency petitions. So if there's a time sensitive issue uh, that needs to be resolved right away, not through the ordinary process, then you might need to help with that. So in the United States, the, the most common form this took, at least when I was clerking, were death penalty cases. The United States still has the death penalty. And it was quite common right before an execution would take place that the lawyers for the, the convicted party to be executed would file an emergency petition with the Supreme Court claiming that they needed to stay at execution because some new legal problem had arisen. And there was often a lot of time pressure there because usually whatever you think about capital punishment, whether it's moral or not, usually the legal issue was frivolous, but sometimes it wasn't. And there someone's life is literally on the line. And so you as a law clerk, it was kind of like writing a cert petition memo. But the, but the pressure is much higher because it, it's, it's, the, there's so much time pressure and the stakes are so high. Those are the main things you do as a law clerk. Um, I, think I, I, think that's, I think I've covered everything. I'm, I'm sure there are other things as well, but those are the main parts of the job. All right, so just another question about clerkship. So people often speculate that uh, for moderate justice, there will be uh, conservative clerks will you know, try somehow influence the justices, so from your experience uh, working for Justice Kennedy, you know, known to be a moderate or swing justice, to what extent does you, you influence justice or how does the relationship in writing opinions or some difficult cases work? Uh, it's a good question. I think there is this idea out there that especially with the, the so-called swing justices or pivotal justices, their clerks could make a really big difference. I think, frankly, this idea has been propagated by some certain former clerks who would like to let people think that they played an outsized role in some real decisions. I think this is greatly exaggerated, greatly exaggerated. Uh, so, so let me see if I can unpack why uh, I, I say that. I should say that there can be issues. There weren't with me, there weren't with my, my co-clerks my term, but there have been issues where clerks' views on legal issues are so different from that of the justices and they're so, they're so 
conflict between them that it, in, that it interferes with their working relationship. And sometimes a clerk can't write the opinion they're supposed to have um, because my, sorry, let me switch mics and see if this is better. Um, because of that conflict. So one of the things, again, that the screeners are trying to do is to try to figure out, is this someone the justice can work with? Uh, and this is sometimes portrayed as the conservative screeners don't want liberal clerks working with Justice Kennedy because they'll influence them with their liberal ideas. Sort of, but I think it's, I think it's more, uh, we want to make sure that these people will have a good working relationship. I do think that law clerks can have an influence over the way justices think about certain cases, but not the big cases, not the big ideological cases. Those cases, the justices know what they think. They have very strong views and they care about the issues so much that there's nothing I would have been able to say to Justice Kennedy or that one of Justice Scalia's clerks would have been able to say to Justice Scalia or one of Justice Stevens' clerks would be able to Justice Stevens to get them to change their mind on how they would rule on an abortion case or a gay rights case or a, a, a gun control case. But it's just not going to happen. What, some 28-year-old pipsqueak is going to convince a 60- or 70-year-old titan of uh, the, the judiciary to change his or her mind? I mean, come on, who do these clerks think they are? Um, where the clerks can make a difference are on these lower profile cases. Not that the clerks, because they're liberal or conservative, will lobby the swing justice, but just because the justices might not know what they think. They might have an initial instinct in a case. Ah, this seems like the right answer here. Like, I just am sympathetic with this party's claim. And then if, as a clerk, you probably don't care that much about it either, but if as a clerk, you really research the issue and you look at the precedents, you say as a legal matter, the justice's initial instinct is actually not the answer that's most consistent with the available legal sources and maybe the justice's own legal philosophy, then you as a clerk might actually change the justice's mind because you'll write a memo that says, well, if you look at the case of you know, X versus Y from 1982, and you read that in light of what you said in your concurring opinion in the case of D versus F in, you know, 1998 or whatever, then the justice might say, oh, yeah, gosh, I kind of don't like it, but nah, I think I'm not quite, I think, I, I think you convinced me that I should vote differently. That can happen. But on the big liberal conservative cases, the ones that make the headlines, I don't think the clerks make, make I don't think they change minds. I think, I think the idea that they do is kind of this myth that I, I, I didn't see it. I mean, Justice Kennedy, on the, like he, he knew what he thought. He knew what he thought on those cases. All right. So uh, let's talk more about the landmark cases on recently, the Dobbs decision. So after the Supreme Court overturned Roe in Dobbs, uh, the public trust in the Supreme Court is at all time low, according to Gallup. Majority of Americans think that the ruling has been motivated by politics more than law. And a number of media has been saying that the Supreme Court is in some form of crisis in confidence. So what do you make of such the current situation as a former clerk, and in what ways do you think that the court will respond and go forward from here? Oh gosh, what a hard question. Um, so as far as I know, the point that you just made is descriptively accurate in the sense that public confidence in the Supreme Court has declined substantially, especially among moderates and liberals. Now you might think that, well, that's, of course that happened. When the court rules on, on political issues, the court's reputation um, suffers among people who disagree with the court's decision. And that's sort of true, but I do think what we've seen recently is a bit different. So after the Bush versus Gore decision in 2000, which essentially ended the contestation over that very close election, made George W. Bush the president, there was a drop in confidence in the Supreme Court, especially on people who were like left of, of, of the political center, but it didn't really last. The court's reputation didn't seem to suffer long-term damage. Now with Dobbs, you could say, well, it's only been couple of years, less really, so maybe it will also bounce back, but I do think it seems different. And I think partly it's because in the US the politics of abortion in particular are so fraught, so emotional, 
that um, I think people reacted very strongly to it. And that's combined with the fact that I think at this point, two generations of Americans, especially but not exclusively American women, had just kind of taken for granted that they had a constitutionally protected right to abortion. There was an understanding this is a controversial issue, people make noise about it, but I think a lot of people didn't think the Supreme Court would actually do it. They would actually go through with it, especially because several justices in their confirmation hearings had suggested that even though they might disagree with the Roe versus Wade decision, they would respect precedent and they would respect stare decisis. Now, not all of them said that at their confirmation hearings, but enough of them said that. But I think people thought this, that this, is, just kind of, this is just kind of for show. Um, I think the extremely contested confirmation hearings that you were talking about before, on issues that weren't necessarily about abortion, but that got people really angry about certain of the justices who were appointed, I think that fed into this as well. And I think that it's a lot about Dobbs, but not just about Dobbs. I think this idea that the Supreme Court has been becoming much more political and much more right-wing uh, has been building up because it's, it's descriptively true. When I was on the court, again, it was, a, it was a conservative court. Throughout most of US history, the court has been conservative. I think sometimes people study uh, the so-called Warren Court era, the 1960s and early 1970s, and, and that looms so large, especially in the generation older than me, like my parents' generation, that there's this idea that the court is kind of a defender of liberal rights, uh, but that's a kind of historical exception. So my so I, I say this all to say that when I was on the Supreme Court, it was a conservative court, but kind of a moderate conservative court. The fact that Justices Kennedy and O'Connor voted with the conservative wing more than the liberal wing, but their votes weren't guaranteed, I think caused the court to moderate in a number of ways. And that's not true anymore. Now that it's a six to three conservative majority, that majority, they can lose Chief Justice Roberts. They can lose Justice Kavanaugh. They can't lose both of them, but they can afford to lose at least one of them uh, in any given case. And just, they've been overturning precedents. Roe versus Wade is the most obvious one, but not the only one. And I think that this has caused a lot of people to say the court has just become an overtly political actor. It's complicated because of course politics always matters. In hard cases, political views always matter. But the court tries to portray an image of itself as not necessarily above politics, they'd like to say above politics, but different from politics. That there's a set of rules, if you will, norms of legal argumentation that constrain the court to not be a purely political actor. That they have to follow the text of the law as written, that they're supposed to follow uh, established precedent except in a narrow set of circumstances where a prior precedent is like demonstrably wrong or has been uh, uh, repudiated by other developments in the law, for example. And so the more that it seems that the Supreme Court is not constrained by those uh, norms and principles, the more people will start to say, this is just a political actor. Like they're not doing something called law that is meaningfully different from politics and they're not elected. Like, they're appointed for life, why should they be able to do it? It's so interesting that this same rhetoric was applied from the opposite end of the political spectrum to the Warren Court, right? When people would say, well, who are these nine uh, unelected people, the nine old men, because at the time they were all men, uh, making these decisions about you know, letting criminals go free based on improbable readings of obscure clauses of the Constitution. Now, I'm not saying they're both sides are equally right. I'm just pointing out what is something I said earlier, the nature of the rhetoric has changed over time. Um, but to get back to your point, I think this has made a lot of people very skeptical about the court and led them to question the power that the court has in US politics. Now, what's the consequence of this? Well, some people have been calling for constitutional or other changes to rein in the power of the Supreme Court. These are very unlikely, right? Co constitutional change is extraordinarily difficult, and even non-constitutional change, statutory changes, are, would be hard to get without both houses of Congress, the presidency, and not just a majority in the Senate, but a super majority, a 60 out of 100 senators, and probably more than 60 out of 100 senators, because there are many senators who would not, even Democratic senators, who would not uh, go for changes to the Supreme Court. So it's extremely unlikely that any of those things will happen, but the fact that people are talking about 
matters like that, serious, like not fringe people, serious people, serious scholars, serious political commentators are putting on the table proposals for constraining the power of the Supreme Court is different from anything we've seen in quite a while. And I think the current Chief Justice of the United States, Chief Justice Roberts, is well aware of this. A lot of people, and I don't have any firsthand knowledge, I don't, I've exchanged pleasantries with Chief Justice Roberts once a dozen years ago. I have no inside information. But many observers of the court seeing his, his opinions on the bench and also things he said outside of the court indicate that he's very worried about this and he would like some of his conservative colleagues to tone it down a bit, right? He was not in the majority of Dobbs. He was willing to decide that case on narrower grounds. I'm not saying he didn't sincerely believe it. He probably did sincerely believe that he, what he was saying, but I think he was also deeply concerned that what actually did happen would happen. I think chief justices in particular are often very concerned, not just with the outcome of individual cases, but with the reputation of the court as an institution. And I think he's really worried about that. Partly maybe because it's silly, but eras of the court are named after the chief justice of that era. We're, I, I clerked during the Rehnquist court era and we're now in the Roberts court era. And I don't think he wants the Roberts court era to be known as the era of an extremely activist far-right conservative court that, that damaged the reputation of the institution. Okay, so next, um, we would like to discuss about the Supreme Court reform. that You have touched on it a little when we talk about the ideologies and the justices selection, but recently there has been calls for the reforms such as adding seats to the justices or having the term limitations and also having a binding ethical code for the justices. What do you think are the reasons behind these proposals? And what do you, do you think it is like possible for these reforms to take place? So I think I'll, uh, most of what I would say about this, I think I just said to answer the previous question, but just to amplify it a little bit. Um, I think a lot of these proposals are interesting. I don't have strong, well-developed views about any of them, except maybe a code of ethics, which I think would be a good idea, which the court could probably do on its own and is declined to, to do so. I think very few of them, if any, have any possibility of being adopted in the short term. You know, things change. Uh, I think that if, let's imagine a world where we're five or 10 years in the future, and the six justice majority has been even more aggressive in this path. And let's say there are political changes in the US where the Democrats control the presidency, the House of Representatives, and let's say 63 or 64 Senate seats, uh, which is un unlikely, but you know, stranger things have happened. At that point, like if there's, you know, back in the New Deal period, this is a little bit important bit of historical context. Franklin Roosevelt won a landslide election. That not only did he win the presidency, but Democrats took huge majorities in the House and Senate. The Supreme Court was still blocking President Roosevelt's agenda. And so President Roosevelt proposed what became known as a court packing plan. Basically, he wanted to expand the size of the Supreme Court. It doesn't have to be nine justices. That's fixed by statute. He wanted to make the court larger. And for every justice over, I think it was every justice over a certain age who didn't retire, he'd appoint a new one. And since he's the president, he'd be making the appointments and they'd be confirmed by a Democratic Senate. He would appoint pro-New Deal justices and flip the balance in the court. So two things happened. Um, and you can draw different lessons from them. So one is that the court packing plan proved actually quite unpopular even with some of Roosevelt's supporters. And it, it cost him politically and it was never actually implemented. On the other hand, the Supreme Court pivoted. Not all the justices, but enough. One or two justices changed their alignment and started consistently voting with the justices who wanted to uphold New Deal programs. And there is a plausible hypothesis. Historians debate this, but there's a plausible hypothesis that, that at least one member, maybe two of the Supreme Court got nervous about this. That, that, like this, that actually this thing could really happen and they wanted to preserve the court's power and legitimacy by moderating. So what lesson might we take from this historical experience? Well, I think one lesson we could take is it's very politically risky to try to change the institutions of, of the Supreme Court in ways that could be characterized as an attack on judicial independence and an attack on the rule of law. And I guarantee you 
that it's already happened for Democrats who have proposed, hey, let's impose a retirement age, let's expand the court, let's do this or that. They're attacked as enemies of judicial independence and enemies of the rule of law. So it'd be very, President Biden clearly didn't want to go there. He formed a special study commission, which was mostly a way to diffuse the issue. On the other hand, it's also a lesson that, well, maybe when things get extreme enough, there really is a genuine threat to the Supreme Court, that the political branches aren't completely powerless, and that might cause the court to change, or at least enough justices to change course a bit. So I don't think it's realistic. Uh, if I were betting, I would bet against anything like this happening uh, anytime soon. But, you know, again, people are talking about it in a way they haven't been talking about it in two generations. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's not a, a coincidence. So uh, one final question before we go through the Q&A sessions. So we'll end on something trivial, but I think extremely important for court watchers in the US. So in the, their own confirmation hearings, justice often get asked about cameras in courtroom. So for those who didn't know, the Supreme Court do not have tele televised oral arguments and have only recently provided live audio feed on their websites. Proponents of the proposal say that it will make the court more transparent. So as a former clerk, do you have any thoughts on it? Or do you think it will improve? Or I don't have strong views on this. I don't think it would make that much of a difference. It was striking to me when I clerked, opposition to cameras in the courtroom was not a liberal conservative issue. None of them wanted. None of them wanted it. Some felt this more strongly than others, but there was a pretty widespread consensus, as far as I can tell, uh, that they did not want cameras in the courtroom. Now, of course, I am very interested in looking and comparing the US system to other judiciaries around the world. That's one of the reasons that I'm here, is I love doing this stuff. And one of the things that I've learned is in many other countries, there are cameras in the courtroom, and it's considered quite important. Again, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I don't know the situation in Thailand, but when I was in Brazil a few years back, they really emphasized it was a very important thing to them that all Supreme Court hearings were televised. Partly substantively, it gave the press more access, and partly symbolically, right? the symbolism of the transparency of the judicial process. Um, and I take that seriously. I think my inclinations are still not to have cameras in the courtroom. And I think the reasons are similar to what I heard from some of the justices when I was there. I think there is a worry about uh, what they sometimes call playing to the cameras. I think, frankly, that's already there. I think some of the justices, I won't name names, but I think some of the justices, when it's time for them to ask their questions at the hearings, especially if it's a high profile case, showing off a little bit, they want like sound bites. I don't think they're thinking this way consciously. I don't think they're saying, ooh, let me write a good sound bite that the New York Times reporter will feature or that someone will put on a coffee mug or something like that. But when people are watching you, I think it's hard. I think it's just a natural human tendency to want, like, you know, you're talking to a broader audience. Um, and I think that's not necessarily a great thing. I, I don't think it would be a disaster. Right? I, don't, I think there's an exaggeration by some of the justices that it would, be a it would be a terrible, terrible thing. I think they'd often forget that the cameras were really there. But I don't know. I, I, I think the, the, it's, it, it wouldn't be great. I, and, and flipping this around, do I think there would be big benefits to having cameras in the courtroom? I think the benefits would be not huge in light of the fact that Transcripts exist, and as you say, audio feeds are now made available. So you can hear what people, like if you're genuinely interested in it, you can do it. And, and there's, a, there's a press box. Reporters are in the courtroom, so they can report on what the court said. Um, I do think, so some people have argued for cameras in the courtroom said it would have an educational function. So um, it's not just that people need to know what the justices were asking, they can read that, but that there's something particularly accessible about video, about television, and precisely for people who don't really follow all these issues, maybe people should watch you know, court arguments that are not about abortion or uh, gun control. They should watch some of these kind of like boring, but maybe important cases. Those are something for law students, or as a law clerk, those were sometimes some of the, the best ones to watch because the justices were less likely to do like grandstanding for the audience or less likely to be giving little speeches, kind of articulating what they already thought. The ones where they were genuinely trying to figure something out, 
about some important but, but maybe kind of technical area of law, this was kind of the most interesting. It's one of the reasons why you know, I clerked at the Supreme Court level. We've been talking about the Supreme Court, but I also clerked at the Court of Appeals level. Um, I loved both. I was incredibly privileged. Like I said, I won the lottery. Right? I, there, are pl there are many, many other law students who had just as good grades as I did, just as fancy resumes, and I got lucky. Right? It's not that I was like one of the 30-something best. I just I was in the pool of people who were good students, and I, I got lucky. Um, I, so I love both clerkships. I was honored to be able to clerk the Supreme Court. Clerking at the Court of Appeals often felt more like doing law, if you will. Especially the oral arguments and the briefs, um, it felt more like the judges were genuinely trying to figure out the answer to hard legal questions where we weren't really sure what they thought. The quality of the lawyering, I will say, was generally much higher at the Supreme Court level than at the Court of Appeals level. You have an appeal as a right in the Court of Appeals, the court can hear your case, the lawyers wants to argue the appeals case. They weren't all great. Some were really good, not all of them. At the Supreme Court, there were a few lawyers who weren't so great. Uh, I won't name names, uh, but a lot of them were really, really good. But at the oral arguments at the Court of Appeals, I, I really felt a lot like they're just trying to figure this out. I actually think televising Court of Appeals arguments might be kind of interesting. Ah, you do worry a little bit about the grandstanding sometimes, but just as an educational function, seeing how those things happen, how the judges ask questions, what they're worried about, that would, that would be really interesting. So on cameras in the courtroom, in the US context, again, other countries might be different in the US context, I'd say probably not a good idea but I don't feel strongly. It's like 60-40 no, if that makes sense. Should we, if we're gonna take questions, should we switch places so you'll be able to see the, um, the monitor here? I know we'll be taking some questions from the audience, but it occurs to me that it'd be hard to move this. So let me relocate over to here. Thank you, Professor, for your insights. So next, we'll move on to the Q&A session. So for the participants in the room, feel free to raise your hand and then we'll pass the mic to you, or you can type your questions in the Google form, and then we'll read it out. For the participants online, please type uh, your questions in the comment section of the Facebook Live. Well, I'll start with the question submitted in the form. So we got a question here that says, how does attain the prospect of legal clerkship upon graduation in the United States? Sure, so it's a little bit what I said earlier in our conversation. It's the application process is fairly straightforward. So you submit your materials, your resume, your transcript, letters of recommendation from your professors or possibly a judge if, if you've clerked for, if you've clerked before. And then I describe, I won't go through all it again, there's the whole interview process. In turn, now maybe the question means not the mechanics of the process, but what qualifies someone to be a law clerk. Typically, people who've performed very well in law school have a shot. What I, especially with the Supreme Court, what I often say to my students when they're thinking, like, do I want to apply for a clerkship? I say, at the Supreme Court level, everyone's chances of getting a Supreme Court clerkship are either low or zero. And if you do really, really well in law school, you can increase your chances from zero to low. So in this big pool, again, in any given year, maybe they're like, for the Supreme Court, like. 200 people, maybe, law students who could plausibly be Supreme Court clerks. What determines the 36 of them that get to do it? Uh, well, part of it is fit with the justices. Some justices care a lot about the political ideology or legal philosophy of their law clerks. They want to hire law clerks who think like them, broadly speaking. Other justices don't care about that as much. They might want to avoid clerks who would really not be able to work with them, but don't really care about that. Sometimes it's just personal fit and personal style. Sometimes certain justices have particular professors or uh, lower court judges whose judgment they really trust because they know them well. And when that person says, hey, you know, this, I got a person who I think would be a really good fit from your chamber. She's super smart. She has a great record. Hire her. That can help you. That personal connection is, is really useful. Again, sometimes the former clerks of a, of a justice might, might weigh especially heavily. Uh, but then there's a lot of randomness to it. So at the court of appeals level, um, there are many more Court of Appeals judges, so there are many more opportunities. So it's not quite as much as a totally random lottery, but it's again, it's, it's basically the same. It's like applying for any job. 
uh, you want to have good grades, you want to have recommenders who will say that you're very good, that you can do excellent work under high pressure, especially they want to know are you a very good researcher and legal writer because so much of the work that you're doing as a clerk is legal research and legal writing so they'll really want to know about that uh, and they'll want to know about your temperament, right? Are you the kind of person who can work with other people? Are you the kind of person who can remember who's the judge and who's the clerk? Right, I don't know if you, I'm sure this is not true of any Chula Law students, but back where I am, you sometimes get really, really talented law students who are a little bit, little bit arrogant, maybe, a little bit like they just think they're the most brilliant thing ever and can sometimes, I, don't, I think judges can get a little bit frustrated when they're dealing with a law clerk who kind of forgets which was the one who was appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So it's kind of good that you make sure you have a law clerk who has confidence but also humility. Um, those are the kinds of things that judges take into account. All right, so uh, next question is an uh, interesting question about amici amicus brief. So uh, the question is, uh, how are amicus chosen to speak in an oral argument? And I just want to add to that. So is amicus brief uh, weight, have the same weight as the, the petitioners or the respondents? Or? So typically, amici, don't speak in the oral argument. There may be exceptions, I'm trying to think of one, but that's very unusual. Um, sometimes the United States government, uh, if it intervenes in a case, will be given an opportunity to present during the oral argument, even if the United States government was not originally one of the named parties of the case. But most amicus briefs are submitted by lawyers who never, who never speak during the oral argument. Are amicus briefs given the same weight as the parties' briefs? Mostly no. Um, but there are exceptions. So I, actually, I should have said this when you asked me about the role of the law clerks in preparing for the oral argument. This is actually kind of important. One of the things that the law clerks do, actually, is to read all the amicus briefs, or amicus briefs, different pronunciations, same thing. Because at the Supreme Court, there might be you know, 30 of them, and most of them don't add much value. So most of them just repeat the arguments that the side they're supporting may. For many amicus briefs, the only page you need to read is the first page that tells you who submitted the brief. Judges or justices will never tell you that that's important, but sometimes it's important, especially if it goes against ideological type, right? Like if there's, if the, you know, Association of Federal Law Enforcement Officials is weighing in on the side of a criminal defendant in some case, that would get people to notice. In the affirmative action cases, I think it was deliberate that the people trying to defend affirmative action, that uh, racial preferences in, for example, uh, um, college admissions, that the people trying to defend those practices got business groups and the military to weigh in to defend those programs because I think the thinking was conservative justices are more likely to be hostile in the United States to affirmative action, but conservative justices also would tend to care about the views of business and the military. So part of the strategy was to get those groups. The briefs themselves didn't add very much. They made exactly the same arguments that the universities were making, but the first page was useful. But every once in a while, an amicus brief makes a legal argument that's different from the arguments in the main party's brief. And so sometimes what the justices would tell the clerks to do is read through the amicus briefs and tell me if there's any that I need to look at. Right? I'll, I'll skim them all myself, but if you come across an argument in an amicus brief that really is sufficiently different from the arguments in the main brief, or that cites cases or statutes that the main briefs didn't get into, or offers an alternative resolution of the case that's not the favored resolution of either the petitioner or respondent, I want to know about that. So that's a function I think that amicus briefs can perform. So I think amicus briefs can perform two useful functions. Um, one of them is just signaling which interest groups are on which side of a case. And again, justices will never admit that that matters, but it might matter in some cases. But the other is sometimes bringing into the mix legal arguments that neither party uh, either saw or wanted to bring into the mix, and the amicus can do it. So every once in a while, an amicus brief can, can perform a really useful function, but compared to the party's main briefs, it, it's quite rare. All right, we got a lot of questions here, so let's just go through uh, one of them. Uh, so this question asks, this, is the life of the Chief Justice different from Associate Justice, or is it, is it not really different? 
It's mostly the same with a few exceptions. So the Chief Justice only gets one vote. Uh, the Chief Justice, I think the Chief Justice's office isn't any bigger as far as I know from that of the other justices. I, it's sort of more sort of first among equals if you've ever heard that phrase uh, is the way I think about the Chief Justice. There are a few things that the Chief Justice has that the other justices don't have. So one is you get to be called the Chief Justice and they name the ear of the Supreme Court after you. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'll never be on the Supreme Court. If I were, like that would be cool. If I were the Chief Justice and they called an ear of the Supreme Court the Stevenson Court, like that'd be really cool. And these guys, have, just like law students can have big egos, these guys can have big egos too. So they might like the idea that like they name it after them. Um, more importantly, more seriously, as I did know when we were talking about how the court operates, the Chief Justice is always considered the most senior justice. So for purposes of things like assigning the opinion or who speaks or votes first at conference, that matters. The Chief Justice also has a role in testifying before, before Congress, basically arguing for more budget or more support for the Supreme Court. is often the public face of the Supreme Court in a way that the associate justices aren't. So in terms of the most important formal powers of the justices, basically to vote on cases and write opinions, the Chief Justice is not different, but there are some ceremonial differences and there are a few important uh, uh, status differences that have to do with things like opinion assignment where uh, the, the Chief Justice really is different from the associates. All right. Yeah, so we have what questions from the audience? Uh, thanks for Professor Stephenson and thanks for the faculty to uh, organize this event for me to offer the opportunity to engage in the faculty. And uh, I'm, a I'm, I'm a Chinese law student, I'm a senior Chinese law student, I'm currently intern in Bangkok. And uh, I want to ask a question because in, actually in China last year, the case of like the Dobbs versus jo Jackson, the case which overturned the rights to abortion, the rooted in the uh, Roe versus Wade, it, it is very influential in China. And actually, Chinese people are concerned about like the first question is like what's the meaning of the separation of powers because we know that the U.S. Uh, the, According, according to the Constitution, the judicial power and the uh, legislative power are separated, which can avoid something like the genocide of the Jewish, Jewish population in Nazi Germany, something like that. If, if the majority of, of the people think we need to violate the rights of the minority, then the, uh, the, the, the Constitution, the, uh, the judicial power can do something to avoid it. Uh, so the first thing is like, uh, if the political acti activities can influence the Supreme Court, how can we se separate the powers? And the second uh, question is about, because I read a lot of books ab about like, legal philosophy in my university, for example, like Renato Dworkin, like the Joseph Ross, actually they care a lot about like the ob object objective standards of the courts, of the Supreme Court. And uh, for, but actually, for a lot of scholars, they think this, this is just a stupid question <laughs> because basically the, the decision-making process is actually the process of political of, uh, activity. So what do you think of, for the Supreme Court, what is the meaning of the legal philosophy? We just like use one theory from legal philosophy as a tool when I, make, when I draft the legal uh, analysis and things. So, so let me start with you. By the way, what, what university are you from in China? Uh, East China University of Political Science and okay. Law. It's in Shanghai. Terrific. No, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I've, I've taught uh, at a Chinese law school for many years, so I'm just curious. Really? You, you know this the, university? Uh, at the Peking University School of Transnational Law in Shenzhen. Oh, okay. So, so let me start with your second question, which my, law, my first year law students are, if I understand your correct, question correctly, my first year law students grapple with this because let me put it crudely, isn't it all politics? Is there any law here? Like, does legal philosophy matter? Do legal sources really matter? When it gets right down to it, do people just decide what outcome they want and just vote for that outcome? 
And sometimes first year law students, I won't speak for the Chula students, maybe you all are different, but what I see in my, my first year Harvard law students is people kind of swing wildly between a kind of very formalistic view of law, that like there's a right answer, and you use the law to come up with the right answer, and a very kind of extreme skeptical, I'll call it extreme legal skepticism, that like it's all politics. These days I think more people are likely to have the latter view, but some of them still have the former view. So my own personal view is that it's a mix of both, and the relative significance of these different things depends a bit on the case and a bit, a bit on the person. And what I often say to my students is um, do some introspection. Think about the way you personally would resolve a, a hard case. So again, I don't know what the exact, how a first year class, law class at Chula would work, but when I teach my first year classes at Harvard Law School, we use the, the kind of uh, Socratic case-based method made famous by movies like uh, The Paper Chase and now Legally Blonde, where I'll give my students a hard case and I'll ask them questions about it. And after we role play the lawyers for each side, I'll ask what they think about it. And so when my students put this question to me, like, it, it, are the judges like voting the way they want? I'll say, well, how do you decide how do you feel like the right answer in the cases that we cover? Um, is it the case that like the law stuff is completely meaningless and you just come out the way you want? Is it the case that uh, the, the, the law just controls it and your own personal views of the substantive issue don't matter? Or is it kind of somewhere in between? And for most of them, it's kind of somewhere in between. There's a kind of a back and forth process between what you think is the just answer or the right answer or the answer that you instinctively feel would be better for the world and for the polity and what the legal materials seem to indicate. And sometimes you'll uh, say, you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but the law requires this answer. I don't like it, but like, this is the law. Sometimes people will say, you know, the law really isn't clear here. And uh, I think that this would just be like the better answer. And I think that I think you can justify it legally and the law doesn't come supply a completely determinate answer. Sometimes people care about their own intellectual and philosophical consistency. So sometimes they'll say, you know, I really don't like it, but given that what I said yesterday in class, I feel like I have to say this today. And so what I say to my students, like judges, believe it or not, actually, are human beings. It's sometimes hard to like, remember this, but there are human beings like us, like you. And they're, they've often been doing this for longer. They've thought, of them, many of them, though not all of them, are very smart uh, and very reflective. But it's the same kind of thing. They, they like the idea that there should be con some consistent principles in legal interpretation, that they should have a philosophically coherent and consistent legal philosophy. But they also have their views. They have their moral views. They have their political views. And that's likely to influence the way they decide cases. And these things are sometimes in tension. So that's, I think, the way I would I would, I would end. I don't think it's all a joke. Uh, I don't think that uh, legal philosophies or jurisprudential ideas are irrelevant, but I also don't think they determine outcomes in any kind of formalistic way where you can take human beings and human values out of the equation. Because people aren't machines. Uh, people have ideas and values, and many people, including Ronald Dworkin, who you mentioned, believe that those human values are not only uh, relevant to legal decision making, but they're part of the law. That was one of the things that was important about his strand of legal philosophy, that it's not that these moral values are something outside of law that may cause deviations from following the law, they should be infused into the law. Now that's a controversial position philosophically, but it just goes to illustrate what I'm talking about. Now let me turn to your first question about separation of powers. Um, the separation of powers, I think, is an important principle. The idea is that concentration of power tends to lead to abuses and it's you're less likely to, to abuse your power if you have to convince other people to go along with you. Uh, you know, uh, um, they, some, people will sometimes say, just to kind of illustrate the point, that an absolute monarchy, not a constitutional mar monarchy like Thailand, but an absolute monarchy <laughs> is the best system of government in the world if you have a good king. But if you have a bad king or a mad king, an absolute monarchy is the worst system of government in the world. And that sometimes it's worth the trade-off of making it more difficult to govern, making government move more slowly, not being able to react as quickly, uh, but, to, but to diffuse power so that power isn't overly concentrated in any one individual. Now, that doesn't mean we should have a complete diffusion of power or excessively strong checks and balances because then the government can't act. Right? The, the challenge is to create a government 
that is powerful enough and agile enough to respond quickly and decisively to important problems, to solve big problems, but without making the government so powerful, without concentrating power so much that it's susceptible to abuse. And we see in US constitutional law and constitutional theory and in the constitutional law and constitutional theory of other countries, and maybe some of you will have studied this in your constitutional law classes here, a constant struggle to strike that balance in the right way. And one of the roles that the US Supreme Court plays in American constitutional democracy is in certain contexts to try to be the referee, if you will, to strike that balance to determine how checks and balances work. Now it's challenging because as you say, the Supreme Court itself represents the judicial branch that's also one of the checks and balances. And we don't want the court to be either too powerful or not powerful enough. And that's, I think, you mentioned the Dobbs decision which doesn't really affect the balance between legislative and executive power. So I think you may be drawing a connection there that's not quite consistent with the, the technical legal aspects of that decision, but one of the things at stake in the Dobbs decision is, is that showing the courts being too powerful or not powerful enough. Opponents of the decision will say the court was acting lawlessly and politically and, usurp and, and, and taking away people's rights. Defenders of the decision will say no, it was the Roe versus Wade decision initially that concentrated too much power in the court, taking decisions about abortion away from state legislatures. Defenders of Dobbs will say we didn't say abortion is constitutionally prohibited, we left it to the democratic process. But then the response to that is, there are certain things that should not be left to the democratic process. People's fundamental rights should not be put up to a vote. And so defenders of Dobbs will say one of the appropriate roles of the court is to identify which rights under our constitution are so fundamental that they should be removed from control by democratic majorities. So it deals with this very complicated cluster of issues, not just of what should the decision be, but who gets to decide. Right? Many of the most important issues in constitutional law, in administrative law, in statutory law are not only or even primarily issues about what is the right decision. They're issues about who should have the power to make this decision. And in a pluralistic society, in a heterogeneous society where people disagree, and this is true of the United States, it's true of Thailand, it's true of China, how do we govern a society where people have very different views on very fundamental issues? And you know, for better or worse, the US Supreme Court, coming back to how you introduced our, our conversation today, plays a very important role, much more important than the, than the Chinese Supreme People's Court does in China, in mediating these kinds of disputes, for better or worse. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have one specific question, but interesting question here about originalism. So recently, some has proposed about common good constitutionalism that critics say goes beyond originalism. So in your view, will this theory or this method of interpretation impact the landscape of the US jurisprudence, on, especially on judicial interpretation, especially on this uh, six to three conservative court? Terrific, so, so let me answer this question by coming back to something I said in response, I think, to one of your first questions and putting this in context for maybe some of the people in the audience who won't be familiar with this terminology. So one of the things that we talked about, I think in response to your first or second question, was what was the relationship between the liberal conservative divide on the court and in the larger community and debates over theories of constitutional interpretation, including originalism and non-originalist theories. And one of the things that I said in answer to your question is that for the last couple of generations in the United States, originalism has been very much associated with more conservative uh, jurists, partly in reaction to the Warren Court. Like originalists said, hey, the Warren Court, when it found, well, the uh, Roe versus Wade was after the Warren Court, but decisions like Roe versus Wade are decisions that are liberal activist decisions that go beyond the original meaning of the Constitution. And originalism emerged often as a way to criticize liberal constitutional decisions of the 1960s and 1970s. So for a very long period of time in the United States, since I was a child, uh, well, certainly when I first became aware of these issues, originalism was associated with conservatism. But one of the things I said in response to your initial question is now conservatives have not just a majority but a solid six to three majority on the Supreme Court. And a newer generation of conservative legal thinkers is maybe reconsidering 
their commitment to originalism, because one of the claims of originalism by its defenders, originalists will often say, hey, originalism is not a conservative judicial philosophy, it's a philosophy of judicial restraint, because we can't read the Constitution to do things that liberals want, but we can't read the Constitution to do things that conservatives today want, we should just read the Constitution to impose only those rules and restrictions that the actual people who, who originally enacted them meant. So cons defenders of originalism, most of whom have been conservatives over the last two generations, have said originalism is all about restraint. And they would sometimes like to demonstrate their commitment to philosophical consistency, maybe to connect this to the previous question, by occasionally, not very often, but occasionally reaching sort of liberal conclusions on originalist grounds. And then they can kind of pat themselves on the back and say, look how philosophically consistent I am. But there's a newer generation of conservative legal thinkers who are reconsidering originalism. One of them is my Harvard Law School colleague, Adrian Vermeule, who coined the terminology of common good constitutionalism. I would not do his philosophy justice if I tried to summarize it very briefly. What I'm gonna say is gonna be a huge simplification. So if he watches this video, he'll get mad at me or I'll ask him not to because I'm gonna simplify it a bit. But it's a, it's a kind of conservative version of living, constitutional, living constitutionalism or constitutional values. So the philosopher Ronald Dworkin, who we were just talking about, who's very liberal, like he developed his legal philosophy uh, in very much a, a liberal constitutionalism tradition and, and, and would use it to defend decisions like Roe versus Wade. Professor Vermeule basically wants to be a conservative Ronald Dworkin and said conservative judges should not be too concerned about whether their rulings are consistent with some notion of original understanding. He very cleverly appropriates the rhetoric and arguments of liberal critics of originalism and says, yeah, you're right. Originalism isn't a completely coherent philosophy. It's not uh, consistent. Orig it's not determinate. It, it doesn't do what it claims to do. And we should infuse, infuse the Constitution with a set of substantive values, but they should just be conservative values drawn primarily from the uh, 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 philosophy of the Catholic Church. Right? He's a, he's a, he is a late in life convert to Catholicism and says basically uh, we should infuse the US Constitution with conservative Catholic values. So he's very hostile to originalism and to libertarianism, which has also been very prominent in conservative legal circles. So I think he imagines himself to be at the vanguard of a shift in the conservative legal movement. And I think it's not an accident He's not alone. I think it's not an accident that a newer, younger generation of conservative legal thinkers is becoming enthusiastic about this set of ideas when there's a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court. And just to be fair, I'm not so sure that the liberal thinkers of a previous generation would have been so excited about, you know, we must infuse the Constitution with moral values and read in powerful rights protections that, that aren't obvious from the text if there weren't a, a fairly liberal Supreme Court during the Warren Court era. All right, so I think we'd have time for one last question. So this one, we have a lot of separation of power questions here today. So this talks about uh, how far should judges go in order to not cross the line of separation of power when talking about judicial activism? And is there any concrete ground to refrain themselves from reviewing the action of other branches of government? Any criteria, any specific thoughts that you might? Yeah, so there's a, there's a broad philosophical way to answer this question, and there's a narrower, more doctrinal way to answer this question. So the broad philosophical way to answer this question really touches on things that I've spoken about earlier, so I won't go on about it, but there's an ongoing debate, a serious debate that, that cuts across traditional liberal conservative lines about how active or restrained the court should be. And it's an impossible question, I think, to answer definitively because we are trying to balance fundamentally competing values. So on the one hand, in a constitutional democracy, we want fundamental policy decisions to be made by those who are electorally accountable to the people. The United States is not a monarchy, it's not an autocracy, it's not ruled by a council of guardians. Fundamental political issues, the, the philosophy of the government is they should be resolved through the democratic process, not in a pure majoritarian vote, but through the system of checks and balances. Uh, where again, where electoral accountability is central. And in a pluralistic, heterogeneous society where people don't agree, 
it's not right for one side to just impose its views on the other side. The only fair way or the least unfair way to resolve those kinds of issues is through some version of the democratic process. On the other hand, it's a constitutional democracy and there's this idea that not everything should be up for a vote. That we're worried about what we sometimes call the tyranny of the majority. We're worried about some people uh, who are being victimized because they're regularly on the losing end in elections. There's this idea that certain freedoms are um, so fundamental that they should not be subject to the vagaries of the democratic process. My humanity shouldn't be up for a vote. Whether I should be able to go to school shouldn't be up for a, a, a vote. My right to voice my political opinions shouldn't be up for a vote. And by the way, the democratic process itself can't function properly if certain fundamental political and civic rights are not protected. Right? If my right to free speech is not protected, if the right for me and my friends to organize uh, into associations to advance our political interests is not protected, uh, then we can't really say that elections reflect the will of the people because the electoral process itself will have been subverted. This is a fundamental tension that can't be easily resolved because, you know, courts have a role to play in protecting rights and protecting the integrity of the democratic process. At the same time, we're worried about courts overreaching and getting involved in making decisions that really should be left to the democratic process. And we're, we've struggled with this for 200 years. We're going to struggle with it for several hundred more. As long as the country exists, I, I would bet you that Thailand struggles with similar kinds of issues in its own distinctive way. Different from the US, obviously, but the, the root issues are similar. Now, there's a more specific doctrinal way to understand the question, which is what are the particular doctrines, tools, techniques that may bear on when a court intervenes and when it doesn't? I'll list, I'll list a few. There are more, but I'll list a few. So first, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, the US Supreme Court has a discretionary docket. It doesn't have to hear all cases. It can, but sometimes the court will deliberately not hear certain cases where it could decide the case because the time isn't right, it's too controversial, there's an opportunity the political branches may be able to settle the issue among themselves without the need for court, the court to intervene. Sometimes the court is, is most judicious, if I may use that term in a double sense, by staying its hand, by backing off. The, the legal scholar, the famous Yale law professor, Alexander Bickel, um, coined the phrase the passive virtues to describe the virtues the Supreme Court sometimes exercised in not deciding cases. There are also more specific doctrines when the court does hear a case to not issue a decision in the case because the case concerns a political question. The court has a doctrine called the political questions doctrine, says, hey, um, this is not a case that we should hear. Um, it had been very rarely invoked until recently when it was invoked in a couple of high profile cases, one of which I think we're going to talk about in our Supreme Court study case. I won't go through the details of the doctrinal criteria just because for a general audience I think that might get a little bit too technical, but basically there are cases where the court says this is an issue that is best left to the political branches, we will stay our hand, we will not get involved. Some jurisdictional doctrines like standing doctrine, though technical doctrines in some ways, have been interpreted by the court as methods for also furthering this interest in not intervening in cases that are largely political. So if there's not a concrete dispute between particular parties about some specific issue, the court will say, we're not gonna get involved in a general ideological disagreement. Show me a real concrete case. There's a debate about whether this doctrine actually serves that function. I'm skeptical. I actually don't think it's been a very productive development of the doctrine, but it exists. And then, Coming back to something I also said in response to one of your earlier questions, there are a variety of what are uh, sometimes called deference doctrines. Doctrines that say when we resolve this case, we'll do it with a, a thumb on the scale, if I may use that English expression, in favor of the elected branches of government. So, for example, when the court is called on to decide whether a, an act of Congress is unconstitutional, the court will repeatedly say, acts of Congress come before the court with a strong presumption of constitutionality. Now, the court has interestingly drawn distinctions among different kinds of constitutional rights. So these days, in contrast to the New Deal era, if someone claims that a statute violates their rights to economic liberty, it's very difficult, almost impossible 
for the court to win such challenges because the court will apply what's sometimes called rational basis scrutiny. If there's any rational basis for what the government has done, it will be upheld. Now, there are many arguments for why we might have rational basis scrutiny, but one is this is a way for the court to stay out of fundamentally political disagreements about government regulation of the economy. In other areas, the court will apply strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny where the burden of justification of the government is higher. In the administrative law context, traditionally, courts have been very deferential to regulatory agencies' resolution of factual evidentiary issues, where they'll uphold it as long as it's supported by substantial evidence in the record, and also, interestingly, on legal issues, where the traditional doctrine for the last 40 or 50 years has been as long as the agency's interpretation of its statutory authority is reasonable, the court will uphold it as lawful. That doctrine actually has come under a lot of pressure recently, and one of our conversations in the study seminar for the Supreme Court will talk about that issue. But right now, I won't go into those details. I'll just use those as examples of specific doctrinal tools and techniques that the court has developed to try to strike this balance between intervening when appropriate, but also not intervening too much in the operations of the political branches. All right. Uh, we have time, I think, sneak in one last question. Uh, yeah. Any audience questions? Or I have one right here that says, does the Supreme Court take into account other countries' jurisprudence? Uh, what a wonderful question. Back when I was clerking at the Supreme Court, this was a more controversial issue than it is now. Let me give you a, the simplest answer I can give you is not really. That's a little bit too simple. Sometimes the answer is yes. Um, not anywhere near the practice in other countries' Supreme Courts. So in, among former British colonies, actually, citation to the law of other jurisdictions is extremely common because they share a common legal tradition, the so-called Commonwealth countries, very common for the former British colonies to be citing not only cases from the United Kingdom, but from other Commonwealth jurisdictions. Supreme Courts in places like Canada and Israel uh, and other jurisdictions are sort of famous for looking to foreign law. The US is notably, and I think unfortunately, parochial in its reluctance to look to foreign law. The one case that was decided my term when this was at the forefront of the debate was the so-called juvenile death penalty case. As I mentioned, the United States is one of the few jurisdictions in the world that, where capital punishment is still legal. But there are certain constitutional restrictions on capital punishment. One of the ones that was being actively debated when I was on, the, on a clerking for Justice Kennedy was whether it was constitutional to execute uh, a person for a crime convicted when that person was a minor under the age of 18. The Supreme Court ultimately held that the answer was no. In doing so, the Supreme Court had to interpret the Eighth Amendment of the US Constitution, which prohibits the exact language is cruel or unusual punishment. Now, um, the originalists on the court, to come back to that debate, would say to figure out whether the Eighth Amendment prohibits capital punishment, including of a minor, we need to go back to the late 18th century when this provision was enacted and look to whether at the time it would have been understood, whether the meaning of the language would have been understood to forbid capital punishment in general or with respect to particular kinds of defendants. The answer is no. The majority drawing on earlier precedent says the meaning of the Eighth Amendment actually evolves over time because they would say we're still adhering to the text, but they would say is the text itself using language like cruel and unusual invites consideration of evolving social understandings of what counts as cruel. Something that might not have been considered cruel in 1890 might be considered cruel in 2005. So the majority says, drawing on other cases, to interpret the Eighth Amendment, we need to take into account evolving standards of decency in a just society. But then the majority, in this case and other cases, went further and looked to the law of other jurisdictions to determine 
Well, what counts is evolving standards of decency and say we should not just look to the United States, we should look to other peer jurisdictions, mostly in Western Europe. So they pointed out that capital punishment was un unlawful in all the Euro Western European countries, the UK, France, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, also Canada, and so forth. Now, the dissent criticized this as inappropriate, that the US legal system was its own legal system, that uh, the Supreme Court would not look to the law of other jurisdictions, for example, when interpreting the First Amendment's right to freedom of speech, which is also treated differently in other countries than it is in the United States, and went further to point out that many of the decisions invalidating capital punishment in European countries were imposed not by democratically elected majorities, but by courts. And so I said, you can't really use that to show what the general societal view is. But I'm just giving you this example to illustrate that at the time, there was quite a bit of vigorous debate about citation to foreign or international law when interpreting US law. Um, there, are, there are a handful of cases where foreign or international law is more directly relevant to the legal, issue, legal question at issue. Uh, so sometimes the Supreme Court just needs to figure out what a foreign law provision means, the same way it sometimes needs to figure out what a state law provision means to resolve the issue before it. But in if the question is asking about looking to foreign law as an inspiration or a model for American Supreme Court decisions, the US Supreme Court is, I would say, extremely parochial uh, and does not tend to emphasize how foreign jurisdictions address similar legal issues. Okay, so that would be the end of the public lecture. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to Professor Stephenson for your valuable insight on the inner workings and the decision-making process of the U.S. Supreme Court, and also express our gratitude to the participants who attend the public lecture today. Thank you very much once again, and may this mark the end of the session.